You know, one of my favorite movies is Avatar. I really love that movie. And not because of its content, and not because of its plot, but I love it because of all the visual stimulation. Those things really got my imagination flowing. I was very intrigued by the special effects as they are absolutely amazing in my opinion, along with the attention to detail that whoever came up with this movie put into it. The wildlife blew my mind as well as the plant life and all the colors. Never in my wildest imagination would I, in my wildest dreams, would I have been able to not only come up with that type of visual art, but also the geography that they developed in the making of this animation was stunning and awe-inspiring. I was blown away. What an imagination on the writers and the visual effects team. All I could say was, wow. And so, looking at all that visual stimuli and letting my mind wander, it made me think of 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, the ninth verse, where it says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So this scripture is inspirational in itself, but when I look at it in its complete context, it refers to man's ability to hear from the very spirit of God and for God to communicate in a way that is unlike any other, as he is our maker. And it gives us insight on not only the things that belong to the spirit world, but the earthly plane as well. So that means that we, by the Holy Spirit, have access to knowledge that under any other circumstance, we wouldn't be privy to. And we're going to see how awesome God is and the reaction of his presence as witnessed by some of our favorite people in the Old and the New Testaments. We're going to see the amazingness of God. And we're also going to get some insight on some things I believe God is trying to show us, along with the revelation of exactly who he is as a person, what he stands for, and who stands in opposition to him right here on Word on the Street with JP. Don't you touch that dial. Don't you. Don't do it. Hey there, family. Welcome to another episode of Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP, and today is October the 23rd, 2022. And on today's broadcast, we're going to find out who God is as a person. We're going to explore our imagination to see how magnificent he has shown himself to be even now. Not only in our lives, but through the scriptures, we'll see his personality through his grace, as well as through his patience and his love for us. And we'll also see the devices of the enemy that are put in place to keep people away from him. So, but before I get into the study, let me first say that it has been documented by historians, Christian and non-Christian alike, theologians, atheists, secular authorities, and other literary establishments that the Word of God is the most historically accurate piece of literature that has ever been discovered and is now being validated globally concerning prophetic accuracy as we are now and have always seen the thing written therein to play out with uncanny detail. Its amazing accuracy can't be denied. So in this episode, we'll also take a look at the subtle deception that the enemy and his agents use to try to get us off track and to doubt the very word of God. Before we get into that, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for this time of fellowship, this time of learning, Lord God, that by your very spirit, 
we would be opened up to information that you would have for us as a culture in Christ and individually. We thank you, Lord God, that we can study and get into the things of God in relative safety. And we pray for those around the world who can't. We pray for Jerusalem as your prophecy of peace would overtake them by the playing out of your word. We just thank you most of all for your Holy Spirit who came by way of your son, the Savior Jesus, the name above every name, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so did you know that because of the holiness and the sovereignty of God in times past, that it was forbidden even to say the name of God as they considered it to be too holy to be said aloud. That's the level of reverence that they had for God. Its original interpretation or spelling was Y-H-W-H or Yahweh. And some say it can't be pronounced, but only breathed as a direct representation of when God breathed his spirit of life into Adam in the form of it has been said that his name is his very breath and that's amazing to me and he has done that for all those who put their trust in him and believe in the Savior that came to redeem us Jesus his name has been pronounced Yahweh and I guess we won't be able to really confirm that pronunciation until we get to heaven. I'm not really concerned with it. I just call him Lord. You know, the people had a reverence for God that was inspired by righteous fear because of God's holy indignation, his holiness. And it was shown throughout the scriptures to them, especially when they found themselves on the wrong side of right. God didn't have a problem taking a brother out back then, but thank God for Jesus. And that reverence that we used to have for God has waned over the centuries. But here comes our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God wouldn't have to continue to destroy those who are disobedient and stiff-necked. He sent his one and only son to put on an earth suit and come down here and have dominion so he could firsthand relate to the plight of mankind and the sin that so easily besets them. He wanted to know firsthand why his fallen creation reacts that way to sin. And he wanted to devise a plan that would enable those who believe in him to be reinstated back into right standing with him, making a personal relationship with God the Almighty through his son possible. So we're first going to talk about the person of God in regards to his glory. Okay, so not only could his name not be uttered, but it is a known fact among the Jewish people that God is so holy that no man is able to look upon him and see his face and live. So in the book of Exodus, Moses went up to Mount Sinai to speak with God. When he came down the mountain, his face was brilliantly illuminated, literally shining. It was so dazzling, in fact, that when the Israelites saw it, they were terrified of Moses. So they made him veil his face, you know. And Moses, as you'll discover in the following text, that he didn't even see the face of God. Okay, so in Exodus, the 34th chapter, the 29th, through the 35th verse, it says, Now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Verse 30, So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Verse 31, then Moses called to them and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him and Moses talked with them. Verse 32, afterward, all the children of Israel came near 
He gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. Verse 33, And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Verse 34, But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with them, he would take the veil off until he came out, and he would come out and speak to the children of Israel whatever he had been commanded. Verse 35, And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Okay, so he had to go through this ceremonious veiling and unveiling in order not to, to frighten the children of Israel because he had been in the pr very presence of the one and only true holy God. And because of that, the byproduct was he was glowing effervescently, supernaturally. So can you imagine being in the presence of God and his holiness, experiencing his glory firsthand, and it having such an impact that it inspires an outward effect. And since it is impossible for a man to look upon the face of God and live, then we know that that clearly was not the case. But the fact is that just by Moses being in the atmosphere that God dwelled in, caused his face to shine with a brilliance so prominent that it frightened all those who looked upon him. So we're talking about the glory. That's the glory of God, something that we can't even imagine or consider as we live down here in these sinful bodies. Those things are withheld from us until we're changed. And so now let's get into the nature of God. Okay. Moses was allowed to see God, like I said before, but he wasn't allowed to see his, him face to face. And so let's look at his nature, okay? Okay, so we're going to explain God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the following. So God, through Jesus, is the one upholding all things by the word of his power. I didn't say by the power of his word by the word of his power. So this indicates that God's power needs containers to dwell in in order for it to be delivered to the destination in which he sends it. And those are called words. And Jesus is the word. So through Jesus, God is upholding all things by the word of his power. He is not passively holding these things together, but he's actively sustaining them right now as we speak by the word of his power. He's holding it all together and he has everything in intricate balance. Do you know that if we were an inch further away from the sun, we would freeze to death. If we were an inch closer, we'd burn to death. So those things that are visible and invisible, God, by his son, upholds them, who is the word of God. So in the book of Exodus is where we can see the very nature of God and how he, if we consider all his power, how he with Moses interacted. And so you're talking about the God of limitless power interacting with his creation on a friendship level. And so to the point where he made a concession for one of Moses' requests, and Moses' request was that he see him. It says in Exodus 33, the 18th through the 23rd verse, and he said, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. Of course, we know that God could have made that happen, but God isn't in the practice of breaking his own laws. Okay. And so it says, and the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in a cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my backside, 
but my face shall not be seen. Wow, for God to concede in something so strict led me to believe or understand the friendship that Moses had with God. So the person of God exists within the triune Godhead that reigns supreme. And we talked about it before. Some people call it the Trinity, the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And we worship this triune Godhead who operates in three different areas. The Father, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And they all appear together in the book of Genesis during creation. God the Father, who created everything through his son Jesus, of whom he used to be able to identify with the human experience. He did that by sending him down from heaven to be able to relate to the sin that the enemy is subjecting mankind to. Exercising his plan through Jesus, or the Son of Man, to redeem man from the law, sin, and death by serving as the perfect sacrifice for the remission of man's sin debt. And he did that by dying on the cross at Calvary for us all, all those who would believe. As if that weren't enough, he gives man the advantage over the gates of hell by leaving himself with mankind in the form of the Holy Spirit who lives in us and will guide us in all truth and all understanding. So by the Spirit, we can know all things, be warned of all things, avoid all things. So can you now visualize how awesome God's plan of redemption is? And so now we've talked about the person of God, the glory of God. Now let's talk about the power of God. Okay, so before I go into the next part of this teaching, the power of God, I have to say that I have had an angelic experience before. Some don't know that, but I have. And just like we see things manifest in the world of the occult, I can attest that these things are real, good and bad, supernatural and natural. They exist on a more solid plane than what we experience in the physical because everything in the physical was born out of the supernatural. In one of my episodes, I told the story about how as a baby Christian, I was ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So ashamed that I ignored the Holy Spirit when he would often tell me to witness to somebody in particular. I didn't. And consequently, God sent me a, a ministering spirit, an angel. And it was the most amazing experience that I've had till this day, except for being able to see the rapture in a dream. But this gentleman was at least nine foot tall. I, I stayed in the World War II dorms at Andrews Air Force Base, the old dorms. These, these um, dormitories had nine to 10 foot ceilings. And this gentleman took up every space in that corner from top to bottom and he, so I, I'm guessing he had to be nine or ten feet tall and had a chest as wide as automobile. He was massive, amazing to look at. The first split second of me focusing and being able to see this gentleman, I was horrified. Horrified in the sense of realizing that we're sharing the same air, you know. But when he spoke to me without saying a word, I knew what it was and the fear immediately left me and the wonderment of being in the presence of this mighty being was overwhelming but calming to know that God loved me so much that he didn't send his messenger to punish me but to minister to me I was awestruck to realize such a powerful being had immense power they had this reverential fear of God. And that gave me some indication of how limitless the power of God is. The angels stand in heaven. The angels stand in constant recognition of God's unlimited power and holiness. 
There have been many stories over the years about God's unlimited power, and it is often conveyed by an angelic presence and their reaction to God. In many instances, when the angels appeared to man, the men fell on their faces to worship the angels because they were so amazing. But the angels' immediate reaction was that they were not to be worshipped, but the worship belonged to God and to God alone. Angels are beings created by God to be ministering spirits to us and attend to us as well as to him. And he has endowed them with immense supernatural power. So, so powerful that it only took two of them to destroy by fire the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And for what I understand, those cities were massive. So in Isaiah, we see a glimpse of the reverence that they have for God as it reads in the sixth chapter, the third through the ninth verses, and it reads, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. So he had that same reaction to the angels and to their reverence for God. And then whoever that was who spoke, when when it's when the power of that shook the posts, then he knew that he could quite possibly be in the presence of the Almighty God. What an amazing thing. His voice is thunderous and smoke is symbolic of his presence, his holiness. And so it starts out again, it says, so I said, woe is me, I am undone. So he was like, I am tripping. He says, because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So he knew by looking upon what he was seeing that he was nothing and that God was holy, reigning supreme. It says, then one of the seraphims flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. You know, God can't dwell in the midst of sin. They need to clear old Isaiah up. Like right away, you know, so they got him cleaned up real quick by purging his speech with that hot coal, eradicating his iniquity during his visit with the one and only true and living God. Then it says, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So God is saying, I'm thinking of you, bro. I want to send you out here on a special assignment and you're going to do this for us. So he's talking about. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then it continues on, it says, and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. He's warning, he's saying, you need better warning, folks. I'm, show, I'm showing them things, and I'm sending them things to listen to, and they're, they don't, they're not perceiving me. So that was Isaiah's experience in the presence of God. And so, Okay, so now that we've laid the foundation of how powerful and immense God's glory is, let's look at those who would dare to oppose him, especially coming into a season like what we're coming into. Okay, so we've had, in my life, I've had 50, 55 Halloweens, but none that have taken place in an era so evil as what we're living in now, as the chosen generation, beginning to see those things in Joel and Daniel and Matthew 24 play out in the in the world. And so we have to be especially attentive to God's will and his word during this season. The enemy of God are planted everywhere. The enemy, Satan has had generations and generations to send people out on assignment and get them situated and comfortable in the place in which they are, hiding in plain sight. So the people 
that would do the will of the enemy are sent by him and already in place. We're starting to see it in our churches. We're starting to see it in some of our pulpits. And these people are great deceivers. So now let's get into this transition into the holiday, the Halloween message. And we'll start off with deceptive people. They're everywhere. My goodness, and the word of God tells us that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves and that we should come out from among them. But with so much deception inside and outside the church, the question begs to be asked, who are they? Who are them? Because they're everywhere. How will we know who they are? These signs will follow them. They will sit on the throne of their own lives, involving themselves in idolatry and ritualistic ways of worship, considering to themselves and their hearts to be their own God. Self-serving is what I'm trying to say. And it may not look like it on the surface, but that is exactly what it is. And some will play the role as long as they can. And they'll play it very well, but for the most part, they will exhibit signs of infiltrating by being selfish. They'll be arrogant with a lack of humility or empathy for others. And the sad thing about that is that we may have to spend some time with them before we really realize who they are by witnessing their lack of compassion for others. Not only will they lack empathy and compassion, but they'll be easily offended and angered, argumentative, and even sometimes violent. And the reason for this is that they often have secret beliefs that don't jive with the things of God, and they believe those things and operate in those things. And the thing about it is we're to love them anyway. And so that is what has been at least in my life, proven to be one of the hardest things that Jesus has ever asked us to do. Challenging, heartbreaking. But Jesus makes it clear that we are to love one another as we love ourselves, them included. Because they, God, God wishes that everyone would come to, to him, that no one would perish, including them. So we can't let our feelings get in the way of God's mandate for us to love one another. And these will most likely privately believe in New Age theologies, the doctrine of the woke, you know, human secularism and Scientology, just to name a few. Those things that take the glory away from the Godhead. So some won't believe in the miracle of creation or sanctity of marriage, and that is made for one male and one female. On the world stage, and sometimes even in the Christian church, we'll begin to see religious extremists who are poised to, to kill for gods that are manufactured with ideologies that stand against our God, gods that don't have the power to bring about salvation or revelatory significance regarding eternal life. God that can't do nothing for you, <laughs> you know, except deceive you into destroying your own life and the lives of people that you love or come in contact. Right now, it seems that anything goes except for devotion and service to Jesus. All other religions are endorsed and promoted except for Christianity. These other religions and people that bring those things into the body of Christ are bringers of confusion and they're meant to divide and conquer. And then you've got the worship of dead relatives, trees, animals, the earth and nature. <laughs> Worshiping the creation rather than the creator. People defaulting to the deifying of other things rather than the one and only true and living God. Worshiping the created, like I said, rather than worshiping the creator. Things are getting absurd. And so... A lot of these things like Scientology and all these things were actually like research projects. They start out as research, but have developed or morphed into theories and have gradually evolved into religious rhetoric distorted from their original purpose and suddenly taken over by the enemy designed to deceive men's hearts and to steal the reality of God the Father 
the Holy Spirit and the Messiah and the fact that the most amazing sacrifice was made in order to save the world from their sins. And that sacrifice was made by our Lord and Savior Jesus. And so we're getting into, we're seeing a lot of self-worship happening in the world and in the church. And we've fallen a great deal in the past decade or so. And now it's in your face. And the world is in rough enough shape as we see evil beginning to be unleashed like never before, unprecedented levels of evil that are acceptable. If having to deal with deceptive people in the church wasn't bad enough, people are involved in blatant self-worship with no regard for who they hurt, you know? And there, it's in your face, all sorts of strange doctrines showing up and have come out onto the scene and are becoming more valid regarding many people's lifestyles rather than continuing on in the sacrificial Judeo-Christian worldview. You see, it's just more comfortable to worship this way or that way. And some even say being a Christian doesn't take all that. But I assure you, it does, according to the Word of God. So we adopt additional practices and beliefs to go along with the gospel that is more accommodating to those operating in alternative lifestyles with almost no one in place to hold those who belong to the body of Christ accountable to the things of God. We've even begun to entertain the idea that there are many ways to God the Father when God's word clearly says that there is no other way by which men can be saved except it be through the Son. The Lord Jesus, our Christ, is the only way to God the Father. Then we find that some like a little occult mixed into their Christian lifestyle, doing things like the burning of incense and burning of sage in order to clear your space of strange spirits and subscribing to this chakra or that chakra in search of inner peace or enlightenment. Now y'all better get it together and get with the Holy Spirit. He is the only thing that can bring you those things while you're living in this earth suit. And some even find that casting a spell every here and there is okay in order for you to get either this or that. All the while entertaining that which is not of God. I've seen it in our young people. I'm just like, what? And we'll pray with you. You know, the word of God says that these strange doctrines are deceptive and are the work of the enemy and known by many cultures as, here we are, witchcraft. The sad thing is that we're finding a lot of our young people believing in these sorts of things. And a big part of the reason is because we, in places of leadership, have failed to disciple them in the things of God. Just have. Just, oh, she got sister so-and-so got saved. You don't call and check on her. You don't see her lifestyle out there, his lifestyle out there. You don't, um, you know, hold them accountable. And you're not a presence and the a, a, a godly figure in their life. And I'm guilty, man. I, You know, we all are guilty. We, I'm just saying all this, that we need to get it together. Because these things have been allowed for millennia. And now we're seeing the fruit of our passivity. And these things are fueling the enemy's agenda, but are, but are now starting to accelerate in intensity lately in the enemy's attempt to halt the fulfillment of prophecy. And people have gotten so far away from God that they buy into these doctrines hook, line, and sinker because they prove to be more form-fitting to the lifestyles that some have come to adopt. I'm just saying. Accepting compromise instead of operating in the sacrificial love that God has called us to. He's called us all to sacrifice in love. But we don't we do not do that. Oh, yeah, I can't be dealing with Sister Jenkins today. Uh-uh. She, she, her breast stick. She always got a hand stuck out. I always got to pay a bill for her. I'm not doing that today. Okay, and so why not? He tells us in his word, if you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto me. So my question to you today and to me today is, what have we been doing to him for him? Hmm. Scary, the answers that are coming into my head. And so as we move into this holiday season, we have to be prayed up and be in the ready position to take on any evil that may rear its head because it's a coming. 
And the first holiday of the season just happens to be Halloween, a pagan religious celebration of the dead where we entertain the occult by emulating it, trying to conjure up the dead with chants and mantras and Ouija boards and mess like that. And we can know that it's right upon us as we begin to see the sale of costumes and paraphernalia starting in as early as August. Man, the ghosts and the ghouls and the goblins and the witches begin to overtake our retail spaces with the witch as the flagship symbol of its arrival. We have gotten so far away from God that we begin dibbling and dabbling in the things of the occult as a cultural practice. And we have allowed this sort of thing, I know since the 60s at least, that where it's just been okay. And I remember watching TV, television episodes about friendly witches start coming on and things of that sort flooded the airwaves until present day considered to be harmless, but that is not the case, I assure you. It was a small seed planted way back then that has grown into something that's unmanageable now in the body of Christ, unless we get on our grind. We've gone from the creepy black dress, pointed hat, and a wart on the chin or the nose, stirring the witch's brew in a giant black cauldron to making it appealing to our youth by using beautiful people who conjure up spells and do manage magic all for the sake of good. Man, if it's not of Christ, baby pop is not good. And what a deception, luring our youth so they can continue to be lost in darkness. And they begin to adopt these things as everyday practices of evil. And it's a part of the norm. The enemy has hoodwinked them into unknowingly opening portals into the spirit realm and inviting demonic entities into their lives, like addictions and, um, and things of that sort. Because of the lack of guidance, they're seeking power and validation from everywhere except God, because those who know God are either ashamed to share him with others or are passive in their faith. I see it. I see it in my own life, and I see it. Um, get big, large and in charge in the world. And they don't know because leadership hasn't told them about the authority that comes with knowing Jesus as Savior and King. So they default to not only what feels good, but to what the culture of the day is. And the enemy catches them young like the church used to. We'll visit that later on in the broadcast. You know, Okay, so the Word of God says that we have been given authority over these things in the spirit realm, but only by way of the guidance of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Jesus. Attempting to navigate these supernatural areas without the resources of heaven at our disposal is not only futile, but is very dangerous and designed to rob you of everything God has promised those who believe and eventually and ultimately to take our lives spiritually and even physically. So it's a mystery, not only how we've allowed some of the subtler practices to seep into the church, but how society has gotten our young people involved. I mean, like really involved from the from from, from just walking. You see folks out here trick-or-treating. By allowing that kind of participation, we are sending them the message that this is all right when it's not. The Word of God considers all forms of manipulation and deceit to be witchcraft. And by us sending this message, we're telling them not only that this is acceptable, but we are actually endorsing it by getting involved with the pageantry of it all. My parents, when I was little, were on board too, you know? And so we just didn't know, nor did we really want to know that God had a say in whether we were to participate in these things or not, as we weren't devout in our faith. And so back in the 60s, that was the age of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and Jimi Hendrix, and the Rolling Stones, you know, and everybody was blazed out and drunk, and those who did proclaim to be Christian got labeled as love child and, and, um, and, um, 
some some face became hippie and stuff like that and so it was just became a passive weak state of christianity and out of those things came cults and all sorts of stuff so it went from one extreme to the next and back then was being a christian doesn't take all that and i remember the first halloween that mom and dad allowed me and my sister to go trick-or-treat mama went with us and we were so excited not so much about the costumes, but about the massive amounts of candy that our counterparts said we would be able to freely get. You know, we were like, I'm not going to do a say trick or treat and have them drop a load on my bag. And we lived on, back then, my first one, we lived on Grissom Air Force Base in Indiana. And I don't know if you know or not, but being that close to Chicago, Grissom shared similar weather patterns without the tall buildings to block the hawk, the wind. And it would it get cold. That hawk would come across the field, boy, and hit you in the in the coon dinghy, and you knew you was, you know, in trouble if you didn't get in really soon. And I remember waking up, I had to be six or seven, waking up that morning, and even though I was six or seven, I recall thinking, okay, I sure hope it warms up before it's time for us to go out there, because if it doesn't, all the candy in the world won't be worth it. And sure enough, time came to put on those little flimsy homemade costumes and go out here and fight the candy war, not to mention the hawk. And dad already knew, he was like, oh yeah, my dad from Chicago, he was like, oh yeah, I, I won't even be able to do it with you. You know, he wasn't having it at all. And I remember walking out the door with the paper bags with the handles that we drew on at school thinking, I sure hope it warms up out here. We didn't get down the block before me and my sister looked at each other. We looked in our bags and we asked each other, you good with that? You know, <laughs> you good with the amount we got? Can we live with the amount of candy we already have and be all right with it? And our body language said it all. It's cold as all get out out here. Let's go to the house. So we told mom, yeah, we done, mama. I don't think it was out there 20 minutes. And she was so happy that she let us eat our fill that night. And she put the rest up for daily rationing. We didn't have a lot, you know. It didn't last a couple of weeks. I think my daddy might have been, and my mama might have been dipping in the teal too. But I was sure that it wasn't worth the sacrifice. The sacrifice of freezing to death on a cold Indiana night. It wasn't worth it, man. So that was my first experience. So I venture to say that I didn't like <laughs> Halloween from, from the time... Up until now. And it was a cute little story, I know. But if we look at it for what it really is, it's worship or at, or at the very least passivity of demonic influence. Dressed up like mass murderers, conjurers of spells, friendly ghosts, and the like. Things designed to desensitize our youth into falling into pagan practices. And it's not harmless. It's very harmful. And I know a lot hiding right there in the body of Christ. And they don't even know that that's what they are, operating in deception, greed, dishonesty. They'll put you together for your money. They don't really dig you, but they dig what you got and want it and will say anything, do anything um, to get it right there in the body. Halloween comes in many different forms for many different people. It just depends on who you are on the side of right or wrong as to how it will affect you. And so let's get into the history of Halloween. Um, Halloween comes from the Gothic Celtic pagan practice of Samhain. It, Samhain is celebrated as the belief that the dead would revisit the earth during this holiday period, welcoming demonic entities back into the earthly plane, opening the veil that separates earth and the demonic realm. So in the festivities are included and still are practiced and considered to be the most favorable time to affect divinations concerning health, wealth, marriage, and death. The opposite of the miracles of Christ. They, so they're looking to the demonic realm to affect positive change when that's never going to happen. Supernatural occurrences are made visible during this time to those who open themselves up to it. This is where Halloween comes from. In Satanism, the high 
Holy Day is celebrated on October 31st or Halloween. So you know there's an uptick in supernatural evil activity during this time. Why would you have little peoples out there? So in essence, we have a lot of ignorant believers honoring a pagan culture that has absolutely nothing to do with our spiritual growth in, in Christ. And when I say ignorant, I don't mean stupid. I don't mean dumb. I'm, I'm referring to the word in its most accurate form, which means to not know. Void of the information. So this is the information. And the word of God tells us not to intermingle our faith with idolatry or compromise. And now that we know, we need to come out from among them who entertain the supernatural that is void of God. And for God's sake, let's teach our people, people, against these sorts of things. For they're looking for us to guide them into a successful, spiritually healthy future. So now that we've identified the evil that comes along with the celebration of the demonic, the question begs to be asked, if we are truly seeking to serve the Lord in earnest, why would we choose a counterfeit to the truth and not serve the interests of the one and only true and living God, the one that made us, the one that sustains us, and the one that saved us, redeemed us. So whenever I forget, I reflect on the power of our God to relieve us of all the stress and pressures of this life. He's powerful and immense, and we're immense in our workings of his power, should we be obedient. And just to know how good he is and has been is refreshing when we think about the goodness of God and to know the limitless power of our God and that is at work for me and for you and in me and in you and is awesome. And once we get our head wrapped around it, it will be an awesome revelation to you as well. So to know that he would have visitation with someone like me and to realize that I can do nothing without him is humbling. And to wrap my head around the fact that he sent his only son, a part of the triune Godhead in Jesus to humble himself. That means take off his majesty, take off his power, his supernaturalness. To come in the form of a baby, take human form, so he would be able to relate to my sin nature and to have compassion on me to take it so far that he was mocked and scorned by his own creation, was persecuted, hated, beaten beyond all recognition, almost to death, to the extent that he was not even recognizable as a man, and then if that weren't bad enough, impaled on a wooden cross to almost bleed out and then to finally suffocate to death for me and for you when he gave up his own spirit, his own ghost. The God who holds the whole world together by the word of his power did that for me so I wouldn't have to suffer that kind of death. Instead, loved me so much that he made me heir with him to rule and reign with him and for all eternity. Isn't that good news? And wouldn't you want to share in that airship? So I realize how amazing eternity will be with Jesus and how, just like how God can open up our imaginations in the form of that movie Avatar, he is going to blow our minds when we finally get to see all the amazing things he has prepared and has held in store for us in heaven. So choose Jesus today. And if you realize that you've been dabbling and dibbling and dabbling in some sort of idolatry, pagan practice, you considered it harmless, or you just out and out a professing witch or a warlock, and you see how fruitless your past has become, I beg you this day not to let the frivolousness and the rhetoric of the enemy stop you from being set free from the bondage of idolatry and demonic influence and from spending all eternity with the one who loves us most, Jesus. 
I remember um, there was a movie that I watched called um, American History X, and the the school counselor asked this ex um, white supremacist who was serving time. He says, "Has anything that you've done made your life better?" And that was the turning point. The the white supremacist turning his life around. So ask yourself the question: Has if you're living that sort of lifestyle, is anything that you've done made your life better? So, I know this message was for somebody, and I want to invite you to a new way of life, a life with the Lord. So, if you want to dedicate yourself or rededicate yourself to Jesus, the true source of power, our Redeemer, the name appointed by God the Father above every name, who sent us the Holy Spirit not to be alone and to know all truths and understanding so much he loves us, I invite you to say this simple prayer after me if you want to know him. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner in need of your forgiveness and your salvation. I believe that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to the cross to pay my sin debt. He was beaten, put on the cross, died, was buried, rose again on the third day for my sin. I ask him to forgive me of my sins, be my Lord, and I will be his. And it's in his name I believe and pray that these things will be so. Amen. So I believe that if you said that simple prayer, that, yeah, Welcome to the family of faith, and my first recommendation for you would be to ask God where to find people that love him and are in relationship with him. Get under those people, attach yourself to a Bible-based ministry, and learn about the things of God that you might be of assistance on this earth, doing his will and working for the best interests of people. And so, thank you so much for listening, watching Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP. If you like what you saw, like what you heard, if it's helpful, I want you to drop me a line at my YouTube channel, which is Rain Radio ATL. That's R-E-I-G-N Radio Alpha Tango Lima. Rain Radio ATL. Make sure that you subscribe to that channel. Hit the notification bell so every time we publish a new broadcast, You'll be notified so we can all do our part of spreading the gospel around the world. Share these videos if they've been helpful to you, that um, we might be a positive influence to the building of the kingdom of heaven while we abide here on earth. And until next time, I love you. You take care of yourselves. Make sure you take care of one another. And until I see or speak to you again, that's right. We'll see you on the radio.